Greetings and welcome to the March on Washington Film Festival Spring Workshop Series, Minding Your Movie Business, Pro Tips for Emerging Filmmakers. I'm Artistic Director Isis Sarabe. We are delighted to have you with us. These workshops are designed to share vital information on filmmaking as a business and a craft. This first one focuses on writers. Films are an integral part of our work with the festival, along with first person accounts from icons and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement. We also have scholars presentations and the visual and performing arts. And we rely on narrative and documentary films to help us unearth the mistold and untold stories and strategies of the movement. In the words of the great Afrocentric political activist and orator Marcus Garvey, a people without the knowledge of their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. The Akan people of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire convey a similar message from the ancestors for the preservation of culture and philosophy in their language system of symbols called Adinkra. One of the symbols is of a bird with its feet facing forward, its head facing backward, and an egg in its mouth. This symbol is called Sankofa, commonly translated to mean, we must reach back and claim what is in the past in order to move forward. That is the essence of our mission and that of filmmakers who have an interest in social justice. The workshop discussions are curated and moderated by Craig Emanuel, one of the festival board members and a seasoned LA entertainment attorney who has been involved in the development, production and distribution of hundreds of film and television projects, negotiated countless deals and juried on an array of film festival panels. As part of this workshop series, we are also featuring selected short films on the Eventive platform by past winners of the March on Washington Film Festival's Emerging and Student Filmmaker Competition. Actor and filmmaker Derek Middleton submitted his short film, Shape Up, Gay in the Black Barbershop, in the competition's first year and won the grand prize for documentary in the emerging filmmaker category. The film is set in Harlem and sheds light on the vital role barbershops play in the African-American community while examining the often complicated relationship gay men have with these spaces. Welcome, Derek. Hello, hello. hello. Hi, I see Sarah. It's lovely to see you. Lovely to see you. Thank you for having me. What made you want to make this film? Growing up, as a queer kid in the barbershop, I, I always felt I was having a separate experience from the other men in the space, but I wasn't able to articulate what I was experiencing out of my own fear and lack of representation. I had never heard another black man admit out loud that they were even uncomfortable in barbershops, let alone afraid. So I suffered in silence for the majority of my life. And instead of focusing on how I could possibly affect change in that space, I focused on perfecting my performance of masculinity so that I might be able to fit in or at least go unnoticed and not become a target of homophobia. Then when I got older and had already came out to my family and friends, it became even more uncomfortable for me to have to keep going back into the closet every time I went to the barber shop. So I started to write a narrative script for a film, a series about the alienating experience that I was having being gay in the barbershop. And I would go back to this script and add to it every time I had a traumatic experience at the barbershop, but I never talked to any of my friends about it. Until hmm. one day I got kicked out of the barbershop for being gay. Hmm. That experience wow. prompted me to open up to a friend. And to my surprise, my friend had stories of his own about all of the awkward experiences he'd had in a barbershop because of his sexuality. 
That was the first time that I realized there are so many other LGBTQ people in the world like myself that experience fear and anxiety in barbershops on a daily basis. So I decided that I would make a documentary first before I make the narrative project, because in a documentary, I'd be able to include the voices in the experiences of so many other individuals. And that's how Shape Up Getting the Black Barbershop became the first ever film made about the experience of being an LGBTQ person in the heterodominant and often hyper-masculine spaces that are barbershops. Yeah. And it was a great film. You had some powerful people there who were telling their truth on the camera. So yes. since mm -hmm. you won the award, what has been happening with you and your film? My primary goal for Shape Up was to spark an open dialogue in my global community about the importance of making these sacred spaces in the Black community safe and inclusive of all people. Yeah. Since winning the grand prize at the inaugural March on Washington Film Festival, I had the opportunity to screen Shape Up at film festivals around the country. And I've also been able to screen Shape Up at private screenings and panel discussions that I've curated on my own at various spaces from the New York Public Library to barbershops and communities of color. And on those panels, I have included barbers from the community as well as LGBTQ people from the community and provided a safe space for them to indulge and, and take part in an open dialogue about ways that we can affect lasting change in these spaces. And those have been some of my most, I'm I would sure. say most significant experiences um, with the film. Uh, last year I was featured in the New York Times in an article titled, When a Haircut, More Than Just a Haircut, Black LGBT New Yorkers are using social media to find, bar to find barbershops that double as safe spaces. And I was also invited as a guest lecturer at Middle Tennessee State University, where Shape Up was used as part of the syllabus for a course called Cross-Cultural Cross Connections. The experience of seeing how Shape Up could be used as an educational tool in a university setting actually inspired me to go back to grad school. And I'm actually in my last year right now earning my degree in human rights. Wow, this one film has spawned a lot. And yeah. you know, you can tell by my haircut that I spend time in a barbershop on a weekly basis. So I know what the conversations can be like in there, but for you to bring this to a barbershop community is powerful. So Thank tell you. me now, you're a little bit down the road from the emerging filmmakers who may be listening. Can you share some tips or ideas for them about how they can proceed with their career and their films? Sure, I'd love to. Um, oftentimes as filmmakers and artists, we only view our work through a creative lens and that can actually limit the possibilities and the reach of our work. When I made Shape Up, I didn't realize that I was actually writing a dissertation through the medium of film. Yeah. Oftentimes people in academia will go to school for years to graduate and then write a dissertation or create a body of work, or they go to school to learn how to critique the artistic offerings of others. I like to say that I went to grad school after making Shape Up because I wanted to learn how to intellectualize my own film work. Mm -hmm. Filmmaking, especially documentary filmmaking, is as academic in nature as it is artistic. And that's something that hadn't occurred to me when I was creating Shape Up because I always saw myself more as an artist than an intellectual. But I would implore filmmakers to be open to viewing their own work through a critical academic lens because it will add another layer and dimension to your work that you might never have considered. Uh, the second bit of advice I would, I'd like to share is dream big and figure out how to get the project made later because if you worry about the logistics beforehand, it will likely discourage you and make you feel like it's nearly impossible to bring your vision to fruition. So I say, if your vision is brilliant and, and it has the potential to affect change in the world, just trust that someone will be daring enough to help you get it made. Yeah. Yeah. And my third bit of advice would be to keep in touch with the organizers of the film festivals that screen your work. 
I like to think of the March on Washington Film Festival as my home festival because I always check in. And not only to update you all on what I'm doing, but also to see if there's any way that I can be of service. And so many wonderful opportunities like this program tonight has come because I kept in contact with yes. a phenomenal team that makes the March on Washington Film Festival happen. So I'd like to thank you again, Icy Sara, for having me. And I thank the March on Washington Film Festival for continuing to champion my work. It's my pleasure. You're absolutely right. You're always top of mind when we either have someone uh, we can think about we want to introduce you to or have you participate in something. So thank you so much, Derek. Thank you. Be sure to catch Derek's film, Shape Up, Gay in the Black Barbershop, free on Inventive for the rest of the month. And now it's my pleasure to turn this over to our moderator, Craig Emanuel, who will introduce his panelists and lead the discussion. You're on mute. There you go. There we go. Welcome. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for what is the first of a series of three fat panels focusing on issues relevant to writers, directors, and producers. I've been fortunate enough to work in this industry as an attorney for more than 37 years, and I'm excited this afternoon with the help of some wonderful panelists to share some valuable information to you as you think about your career paths as writers. Over that period of time, I've been lucky enough to work with some truly wonderful clients, including the two writers who are on our panel this evening and have been fortunate enough to work with some wonderful attorneys over the years, sometimes as colleagues and sometimes as opposing counsel on the other side of a deal. And today we are fortunate enough to have a highly respected attorney in our industry that any one of you would be lucky to be represented by. Before we start talking to our panelists, I'd like to take a few minutes to briefly introduce each of them to you. Hannah Wegg is both a screenwriter and a producer and someone I have known and represented for more than 25 years. Hannah is known as an actor's writer with a reputation that is based on characters and dialogue that are richly layered and authentic, and which have attracted the attention and interest of Hollywood's finest talent, including Kate Blanchett, Kate Winslet, Salma Hayek, and Adrian Brody, in the wonderful films Septembers of Shiraz, and such acclaimed directors as Kenneth Branagh. In television, Hannah's work includes an adaptation for Amazon and ITV of the novel Chang and Eng about the lives of the original Siamese twins, as well as recently working on a project entitled The Witch of Wall Street about the life of Hetty Green for producer Ed Pressman. Hannah has two projects heading towards production, including The Beautiful and the Damned, The True Story of Zelda and Scott Fitzgerald, and The Garden of Last Days, an adaptation of the novel by Andre Dubois III, of which Hannah will also be directing. Hannah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for having me. Gordon Bob is a partner in the Santa Monica law firm Dell Shaw Moonves, Tanaka Finkelstein, and Lesgano. Gordon's practice focuses primarily on the representation of actors, comedians, athletes, writers, directors, production and distribution companies across television, film, and multimedia platforms. Gordon began his legal career in 1996 as a, as a securities attorney in New York, and then realized the true passion was to work for the arts and moved to Los Angeles, where he's been working with Del Shaw since 2000. Gordon is on the board of directors of the Black House Foundation, a nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding opportunities for black filmmakers and encouraging their inclusion at world's premier film festivals by fostering an environment for continuing support, community, and education. And he is also an active member of the Black Entertainment and Sports Lawyers Association. Gordon's clients include the extremely talented director and writer Stella McGee, who is working on the biopic, I Want to Dance with Somebody about the life of the late Whitney Houston, as well as representing the very talented Lena Waithe, who has worked on such projects as Dear White People, bad hair, and a new project entitled Such a Fun Age. Gordon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Luke Davies is a screenwriter, a novelist, and a poet. One of Luke's early novels, Candy, a story about love and addiction, 
was produced as a movie in 2006 starring the late Heath Ledger, Jeffrey Rush, and Abby Cornish. In 2017, Luke was nominated for an Academy Award as the writer of the film Lion, directed by Garth Davis and starring Dev Patel, Rooney Mara, and Nicole Kidman. Other films produced based on Luke's work include the recently released Tom Hanks film, News of the World, together with the moving film, Beautiful Boy, starring Steve Carell and Timothy Chal Chalamet. Like Hannah, Luke has started working more in television, having written and been an executive producer on the series Catch-22, starring George Clooney, and is currently in development as a writer and executive producer on a series entitled The Most Dangerous Man in America, starring Woody Harrelson to play the role of Timothy Leary. Thank you, Luke, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, after I finish the questions with the panelists, I'm hopeful that we're going to have a little bit of time for some Q&A so you can ask some questions, which I believe you can direct to the producer through chat, who will then forward the questions to me at the end of this discussion. So let's, let's get started. I'd like to start by each asking each of the panelists what it is about their current careers that drove them and motivated them to want to pursue their career in the arts. And how did they get their start in such careers? So Hannah, maybe we'll start with you and then Gordon and then you, Luke. Hannah. Um, I think the thing that motivated me the most was probably uh, my exposure to so many different cultures as a, as a kid, actually. Um, I was un unusual um, in the United States to travel as much as I did. And I went to places as far flung as the Soviet Union, as the People's Republic of China, uh, all in very early years, 1972, 1978. Um, I was in Kenya, in Tanzania. Um, and so I, I was really, um, I, I was forced very early on to, um, and, and lucky enough, actually, very early on, um, to have, to want to understand all of these other places. Um, and I think the fundamentals of storytelling uh, are that, you know, we tell stories in order to engage empathy in others. Um, and we also, the, the act of storytelling is an act of empathy because you are by definition putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, and those are the stories I like to tell. I like to tell stories about, about places and people um, that we know less about um, and that we might not necessarily be empathetic with if we didn't know them better. Um, so I think, uh, is that, does that answer the question? Is, yeah, and then, and then how did you take that interest and then start your career? I, I did decide that I wanted to go to film school. Um, and so uh, I applied, I, my parents were not gonna pay for that. Um, so I, I ended up with a, with a fellowship. Um, I applied to, for grants and, and got them. Um, and I think it was a really important training ground for me, um, in part because the school, uh, I, I ran into the kind of um, narrow-mindedness sometimes and rejection and especially as a woman um, that I was going to meet in the business except that I actually found the business to be more accepting um, and you know the I eventually left film school and I got a job reading scripts that's part of how I learned what to do with a script um, and I read as a, as a reader for ICM, for various agencies, um, and eventually uh, wrote my first script while I was still in graduate school uh, and was lucky enough to be hired uh, actually before finishing graduate school. Um, and I never looked back. I was, I was quite lucky, but I, but I gave myself the, the, um, the access to people who would read by taking these jobs where I was reading for them. And so when I was done, I was able to walk into somebody's office and say, hey, I just finished my first script. And because they're development executives, it's their jobs to say, can I read it? <laughs> so that was sort of 
how I how I began. Terrific, Gordon. How about you? Sure. Um, I, I guess the, the, my earliest uh, memory of being um, kind of uh, whisked away or taken by the arts uh, was in um, summer of 1989. I, I was watching, I, I grew up in New York, in Brooklyn, New York, and I uh, went to see the film Do the Right Thing by Spike Lee. And it was the first film that I watched that um, really reflected uh, my personal surroundings. And it was a story that I can relate to the characters, the situations, um, the the storyline, um, and it was so, it was it was so rich and beautifully shot and, and the vibrant colors, and it really brought um, you know storytelling and, and Hollywood to to me personally, um, and that was uh, kind of my first taste of it. And then uh, I, I went off to um, study actually. Um, political science, um, because I thought I wanted to go into government, um, but um, quickly realized I didn't want to do that. Um, and so um, my focus then shifted back to kind of that, um, you know, the pursuit of the arts. And I knew that I wanted to be, um, you know, apply to law school. So I, I ended up going to Columbia Law School in New York. And one of the reasons I chose Columbia was that they have a very a uh, well-regarded school of law, uh, law of the arts. Uh, we call it the Kernikan School of, uh, of Media, I believe it's called now. Um, and so I just uh, absorbed everything I could, um, every class that I can take, uh, every internship, uh, externship, teaching assistant. Um, and, um, you know, that was kind of my uh, way of kind of really immersing myself uh, one of the things that we did uh, at, at law school uh, was um, volunteer for Volunteer Lawyers of the Arts, which is, which is a nonprofit organization um, that helps uh, artists, mostly struggling artists, um, with free legal advice. So that was one of the things I did in law school. Also at the time, my best friend from um, college was also at NYU Film School, and I was helping him make his student films. Um, and you know, get him, you know, sneak him onto campus and shoot while he <laughs> shoot scenes that uh, he didn't have to pay for. Uh, but uh, so that was kind of my my first um, foray into the business. So, you know, as you mentioned in my introduction, I did get sidetracked for a couple of years uh, and uh, practice corporate law. But then I, I quickly kind of realized that my passion did, uh, was for the arts, and I and I, I moved to Los Angeles. And um, and I was fortunate enough to um, to join uh, the firm where I've now been for the past 20 years and have uh, just been able to uh, create a career uh, working with such talented writers and directors and producers um, and who tell these 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 uh, wonderful stories and narratives that really impact social change. Because for me, it was really about um, using the power of law to to um, impact social change and move culture forward. So that was really my focus. That, that, that's, that's what kind of struck me about that film that I mentioned earlier. And that's kind of been my mission for my, throughout my career. Thank you. Luke. Well, mine was a very singular kind of blinding flash light bulb experience moment when I was 13 years old. I was just wandering the bookshelves of the school library and I pulled out this book, Cannery Row by John Steinbeck. And up until then, I'd been reading. I was a little read reader kid. But, you know, they were those books for kids with their neatly packaged moral messages and so on. So I read this Steinbeck novel and I enter this world of uh, a much more complex uh, moral and emotional universe. And um, and it was just, it was like I, it was like I stepped inside a palace with an infinite number of rooms at that moment. And I've been wandering around in those rooms ever since, you know, that's the palace of literature. And then three years later at 16 years old, I, I had this, uh, another blinding flash experience, which was wandering into a theater in Sydney where, where I was growing up and, um, and seeing this Werner, Werner Herzog movie called Aguirre, the Wrath of God. And I, I was into films from like 12 years old or whatever, but I had no idea that you could tell stories this way. And so that was like entering another palace with an infinite number of rooms to wander about in cinema. And so the experience in both of those moments was like 
oh, now I know what I want to do in my life. I, I want to affect people the way this book just affected me and changed my life, a Cannery Row, or the way this film affected me and changed my life. So that's, it began, two-step process, but the, the big <laughs> one was 13. And even when I tell that story now, the memory is so concrete and precise because the emotional experience was so fantastically overwhelming in the best sense. Um, thank you. Hannah, um, I'd like to turn to the question of, of, of representation. Um, and perhaps you can tell us, how did you get representation, you know, as an, with an agent or a manager? And do you think it's become more difficult in the last, you know, 20 years? Um, and perhaps you can touch on, you know, whether or not an agent or manager has opened doors for you and how have those people helped your careers? You're on mute. being polite, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, it goes back to having been a reader um, for production companies where I was reading scripts and covering them. Um, I, you know, as it happened, you know, and this is, this is a long time ago and it's a time when, you know, it's 25 years ago, um, when writing really, when only the writing mattered. Um, and only the quality of the writing mattered. And so when I finished my first script and I was reading scripts for a production company, I walked in and I said, oh, I, I finished my first script. They read it. It happened to be a woman who was dating a young man named John Lesher. And, um, and that is how I got my first agent. Um, she, she basically said to me, can I give this to my boyfriend? Um, and I said, sure. Um, and uh, in truth, I had really no idea about what agents did or, or, or what they could do for me. And I had to learn as I, as I went along with him. Um, and over the years, I have in fact um, learned quite, quite a lot about how to have that relationship. Um, and how you handle that relationship is um, is is in direct proportion to how uh, productive that relationship can be. I think, um, and I've had a variety. I've, I've had, I think, five agents in my lifetime. Um, some I broke up with. Some broke up with me, um, and uh, and that's to be expected. Um, Sometimes you outgrow a relationship. Sometimes uh, they are not doing for you what what you expect them to do. Um, sometimes they don't understand you. Sometimes they want you to be something that you're not. And I think it's really important that um, in approaching an agent that you don't that you don't expect the agency to be working for you. You expect the one person with whom you have the relationship to be working. With for you um, because they're the one who is going to get on the phone. And very early on, I had uh, sharks as, as, as agents and representatives and attorneys. And I found early on that I didn't want to be represented by sharks because I'm not a shark. I wanted to be represented by gentlemen and women, um, by, by, by people who reflected who I am and my values. Um, and so over time, I made those shifts so that I found myself among people who much more reflect who I am as a, as a person. Um, later in the business, the business shifted. I mean, for many, many years, writers did not uh, need to have managers. Um, and at some point about 10 years ago, that began to shift because the agencies became so bloated and so huge that their individual relationships with individual clients, they ended up with so many different clients on their list. They, and their, the pressure on them to produce a bottom line became almost untenable. Um, and so agents went from being people who, who, who shaped careers to people who made deals. And now the manager has stepped in as the person who really can be 
more of a shaper of a, of a career. And I've been very, very fortunate to have uh, an extraordinary manager um, who found me. Uh, and I, I had one manager before that who made me very suspicious of managers. Um, and so I had to be convinced um, the second time around. Um, and uh, the second time around has been career changing actually. Um, and I, and, and he has opened a landscape of, to me of, uh, producers who I had not come to know, uh, earlier in my career. Um, and then of course there's my attorney who, um, who has, has been, you know, the, the Maserati of my team all, all these 25 years. Um, and I've been, but, but similarly before I met you, uh, and I think you can attest to this, I was sort of like a battered bird because I'd come from a, a shark tank and I just didn't know, you know, it, it took time for me to learn to, to trust and sustain the relationship, I think. Um, but all of those relationships that I have now are incredibly valuable. And I do find that uh, they are opening, constantly opening uh, doors and opportunities for me now. I think it's easier for them to do that now, however. I think it was harder for them to do that even as recently as five years ago um, because, and I'll, I'll tell a small anecdote and, I'll, and then let it go, but I remember, Craig, you said to me once, probably 15, maybe 17 years ago, oh, I should be able to get you X amount of money for this deal because I just got it for a young man who's never written anything before. And I recall saying to you, I think the operative term in that sentence is man. And you weren't able to get me the same price that you could get for him. And that wasn't your fault. It, it was systemic. And that's also changing. So that's actually a very exciting part of my career right now is to be on the other side of that wave. So. Um, thank you, Hannah. Um, <laughs> Gordon, when do you think a writer should contact an attorney and what are some of the things that you consider when you're thinking about representing um, you know, a writer? I mean, sometimes writers ask the questions, well, why do I need a lawyer if I've got an agent who I'm paying 10% and a manager 10% and I might have a business manager that's another 5%. So what do you think is the time when a writer really should reach out to an attorney? Well, uh, first, I, I, I want to say, Hannah, I, I mean, I was, I, I felt everything you said in terms of, um, you know, being represented by someone who understands you, because I, I tell potential clients that all the time, um, that at the end of the day, you know, what Craig does and what I do, <clears throat> you know, there are a lot of qualified people who can do that, um, you know, in our business, but I think what um really makes a difference in 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 representing in representing talent is that you actually understand and represent them you know because you are the voice um for that talent and so you have to kind of understand who that person is to represent them effectively in my opinion mm -hmm. so um so thank you so much for sharing that because i i i, I say that all the time and i thought i was the only one <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, but um, but to your, to your question, Craig, um, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, you know, some, it depends, you know, when writers, if they have a piece of intellectual property that they are actually, you know, selling um, or uh, shopping, um, I think, um, you know, to get an attorney involved um, at the outset is, is pretty, pretty uh, crucial. Um, because um, you may enter into a, 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 an agreement or a deal for the exploitation of that property that, um, you know, th let me back up, think of, think of it as a bundle of rights. You know, when you have and you own um, underlying uh, intellectual property, whether it be a book, screenplay, or whatever that is, what you actually own are a bundle of rights. And when you are entering into a deal, um, what you're trying to do is um, you know, um, bargain for the exchange of consideration for those rights, but making sure that you, each one of those rights or the, or the collection of those rights are 
or properly valued. So, um, so in, in my opinion, I think if that's if that's where you are in the process, you should get a ter- an attorney um, at that point. Now, if you're not there yet, if you're just starting out as a writer, if you're you know getting your first deal, whether you're a literary writer or um, you know screenwriter, um, or graphic novel writer, whatever you are, um, you know it may not necessarily be the the appropriate time to get an attorney. You may want to get an agent who can actually get you a a deal, you know, with a with a publisher or or, or a studio. Um, but you know, once that you know uh, job or deal or is secured, then I think that's the, the appropriate time to to get an attorney. Um, thank you, um, Luke. One of the things that Hannah referenced is the important importance of having uh, people in your life who really have the same vision and share the same common agenda as as, as you do. Um, when you're making a decision to work with a producer that obviously can have a profound impact on how your project's going to be produced, whether it's going to be produced. What are some of the things that you look at when you're thinking about forming a relationship with a producer? One, if you've got a spec project and you're trying to identify a producer, what is it that you look for in, when, you're, when you're making that decision? Well, I think it's... Uh as both Gordon and Hannah have said in different ways, it's about finding like-minded um, people to work with and how do you find those people. It's about having your ears and eyes open and a certain kind of sympathetic empathy and a trust in your trusted advisors, your representatives or whoever that may be, your friends, about who are good people in the industry. And, um, yeah, and some of that is really just uh, word of mouth, reputational stuff you know you don't it's you don't want to work with people who you've heard bad stories about people betraying you know be, people being backstabbers or betraying situations and and so on but there's also a way of just growing gradually into the situation and and get, getting a, the ability to trust your gut about certain things i like what hannah said about you know the gentlemen and women <laughs> Finding those people, I would count you as one of those people, Craig. Um, and um, my anecdote about that was when I came to LA in 2007 with my little Australian film, Candy, which I, I'm still very proud of, and it's a film that stands the test of time, but it's a dark little indie tiny film. And so I, the meetings that I could get to try and get representation, I had that experience of discovering that the, the world of the agency world uh, is a basically a heat-seeking um, enterprise. And so the meetings that I was having were like, hey, you, A, you're a nice guy, B, love your little film, and C, when you get some heat on you, we really look forward to talking to you again. <laughs> that was my experience for years. I couldn't get an agent. I couldn't get in the door of any situation or any place, despite my cool little indie film <laughs> that I wrote, didn't direct. Um, and um, and I remember going to lunch with you, Craig. I somehow hustled a meeting with you, and um, and it was a lovely lunch. And you know, I learned very quickly that you operate at a certain level, and that I had nothing going on, like no heat. Not that you were that kind of person, but I I just remember saying to you, I really look forward to to, to one day coming to you and saying I've got some stuff happening, and will you be my attorney? And you were like, I look forward to that day too. And about five years later, I remember when that day happened when I was like, Craig, can you be my attorney? There's some, there's some action happening. There's some heat. Thanks. Thanks, Luke. Um, Gordon, um, when a writer often starts out and they've got a spec script and they're, they're forming a relationship with a the producer, they're faced sometimes with the producer wanting to option the material or enter into a shopping agreement for the material. Could you briefly just describe what the difference is between the two? And also, you know, sometimes a writer enters into an option agreement and, you know, how long is it reasonable to ask that a producer should be able to option material? So if the project is languishing in, in no man's land, I mean, what recourse does the writer have to try and do something about that? All right. Well, uh, the, the simple distinction between a shopping agreement and an option agreement is the shopping agreement, you don't get, you get no money 
in the option agreement, at least you get a little bit of money up front. Um, but um, it's, it's it's two kind of sides of the same coin. Basically, in an, in an option purchase agreement, um, the producer or whoever the entity is, is actually optioning, in, in other words, buying the right to purchase the script at a, at a later date um, and basically taking that uh, material off of the market uh, for a period of time, um, either to shop it to other buyers, to develop it further before going out and, and selling it. So in, in an option purchase scenario, you will actually get, you negotiate out the entire deal. So it'll be an option payment, which will be applicable against a purchase price in the future once the producer you know, turn, um, decides to buy the project, if the producer decides to buy the project. Um, in a shopping agreement, um, it, it effectively is, is the same um, is the same result in that the producer is taking the, the um, project off of the market, um, but it's basically an exclusive arrangement or exclusive agreement that you as the um, writer and owner of the property will not allow anyone else to shop the project during a, a certain finite period of time uh, while the producer tries to set up the project with a buyer. In that, in that case, there is no deal um, typically negotiated up front, only that once it is set up or if it is set up with a buyer, then you as a writer will have the opportunity to negotiate your deal directly with the buyer. So that's, that's, that's the difference in, um, in those two arrangements. In terms of the timing, um, option agreements typically um, – the, kind of the, the studio kind of standard for an option agreement is 18 months. Um, and then with an 18 month extension, if it's, if it's a feature film, a script, uh, that's, they typically like at least that amount of, of time to develop and produce or have the opportunity to develop and produce. Um, obviously, you know, as talent representatives, we like to see that time frame shortened um, considerably. Uh, especially if it's in a, a shopping, exclusive shopping agreement, because again, there's no consideration changing hands. So, um, you know, we'd like to see that shortened, but, you know, somewhere between six months to a year. Um, Gordon, a a as a follow-up um, um, question, how does, a, how does a young writer today, when they're going and pitching an idea for a story to a producer or a studio, how do they protect themselves that, they go in, they've got this great idea. The studio says, look, thanks, but no thanks. And then all of a sudden, two years later, you, you pick up the paper and you see that a film that your story seems to have been based upon um, has somehow managed to get into production and, and you're not involved in it. What can writers do to protect themselves, um, if anything, against that happening? Yeah, I guess that's the writer's like worst nightmare, right? Um, uh, fortunately, it happens um, infrequently, um, but I, I will say, you know, in order to protect yourself, obviously, if and this is, I guess, going back to what copyright law actually is, you cannot protect an idea. Um, a, a, an idea is not protectable under copyright law. Only the physical expression of that idea is protectable. So you may have the, the greatest idea for a book or film, or whatever that is, in your head, and you express that verbally to someone else, that's not protectable. That person has the right to take whatever you said and go off and, and do what they want with it. Um, so what is protectable is the written expression. So when you have those ideas, write them down um, and, and document those ideas. Um, and then the second thing you should do is register those um, documents, both with the your Writers Guild organization. If you're on the East Coast, that's the Writer Guild, Writers Guild East. If it's the West Coast, Writers Guild West. You can go to their websites. Uh, it's very easy to register a screenplay or work of literary material. Um, you don't have to be a member. You can, you can always uh, register it there. Um, and what that does is it, it, basically a date stamp. So that is proof positive that you actually you know, created this work on a specific date. Uh, the second thing you should do is go to copyright.gov 
which is the United States Copyright Office website, and register that work with the U.S. Copyright Office. Again, it's all digital now. You don't have to physically send it in. You can just um, digitally upload it. And that actually um, avails you of the uh, United States um, federal copyright laws. And, and you're able to then pursue a copyright claim if you have to down the road with, for, if someone does steal your work. Now, you should know that, you know, I think what's what's the uh, the the saying in Hollywood? There's no original ideas, right? So, um, that you know, you, you may think that you've got the most original story, but there could be five, ten, fifteen, twenty stories like it floating around, you know, studios in Hollywood. So, it, that's the the only way you can really protect what you did is to actually register it. Um. Thank you. Luke, um, often when you're working um, on a film with a producer or on television with a group of writers, um, I imagine, you know, obviously the aim is for it to be a collaborative process, but sometimes I have to imagine that you, you may have a strong perspective about a particular aspect of the story and the producer or perhaps other writers in the room have a different perspective. Um, and it's that challenging moment when, on the one hand, you know, you want to be thankful and, and, and grateful for the opportunity to be in the project. And it's another thing to want to make sure that your voice, you know, is heard. And I'd just be curious if you have some advice for, for the writers. How do you how do you address and deal with that issue? Well, <clears throat> I'm I mean, one thing is I'm looking forward to the trauma of having that situation happen in a writer's room because I haven't actually formally been in a functioning uh, staffed writer's room on an ongoing project. The, the, the television things that I've done have developed a bit more haphazardly and informally. Um, so, but yeah, it's, the, it's part of it is like stand up for your rights, uh, choose your battles, uh, be an open collaborator, play well with others, listen to notes because they're often going to be good notes, especially if the same notes keep coming to you. And part of it is stand up for what you believe in about the things that are important to you. Um, and I've had the experience of disappointment of things being uh, changed that I worked on and wondering why was that decision made or why was that decision made? I've also had the experience a couple of times of things not really being changed, which when it's happening feels really good, but red flag, it can be a sign, in fact, that as the thing is going into production, that the, the director's not really paying much attention to what's going on or structural problems or issues and so on. Um, but um, I think it's a delicate dance between pushing forward with the things that matter respectfully with your colleagues and uh, letting things go and saying, okay, what, what would happen if I let go of that way, I, way of thinking that I had? And what would happen if I opened my mind up to that possibility and explored it? Um, Hannah, I'd like to, to move back to you for a moment. Um, how have the recent events of the last few years, um, including the Me Too movement and the focus on issues of gender equality, change the opportunity for you uh, as a writer? I mean, do you feel that historically you were treated less favorably than your male counterparts? And I think we heard that answer probably before, but do you think this is now a more level playing field? And do you think you're being treated with greater respect than you had been previously? There's, there's, there's no question, actually. Um, you know, when someone like Ted Hope walks into a into a meeting as the only man in the room and at, at Amazon and says, I know I have a target on my back. Um, you know that the, that the balance of power has shifted because he's the only man in the room. Um, and for 20 years, I was the only woman in the room. And I was also the only woman and I was the, I was the, I was so young. I mean, I, most of the guys that I was dealing with were a full generation older than I was. Um, and that's not to say that these men didn't help me in my career. They absolutely did. Uh, in fact, the women of my generation did not help other women because they had had to fight so hard to get 
uh, into the rooms that they were in, that they felt that the real estate for women was limited. So they needed to be the only woman in the room. Um, and one of the great joys of uh, what's happening right now in my career, uh, it's twofold. It's that I'm getting to mentor young women um, and that the young women want those relationships. They want the relationships with, with, with older, more experienced women. Um, and I'm learning more from them for the most part than they're probably learning from me at this point. Um, and there, and because, you know, I've been writing strong female characters for 25 years. Uh, a good example of that is at Warner Brothers, I wrote a story about a woman who had a one night, a married woman who ended up having a one night stand with a man uh, that she, who had been the father of, of her child and who had ditched her very early on. They bump into each other, they have a one night stand. It turns out the man is now has a disease and he's dying and she brings him into the family and her husband actually accepts him and what happened. Warner Brothers decided not to make the movie because they said if she'd been a man, it would have been fine. But no one was going to watch a woman in a happy marriage have an affair with somebody outside the marriage. And that was in 2000. I mean, that was, I thought, what? century are you people living in? And so this was something I, ex I also experienced time and again, male actors not wanting to attach themselves to scripts where the women in the scripts were as well written as the men. Because they would be, they would have, they would have to play on equal footing. Uh, so again, time and again, uh, getting the, the male star who would drive the script financially was a, a, a game of, of, of sort of constant Russian roulette. We were just spinning the wheel and shooting and not, not finding that, that, that person to play the role. Um, so over the years, what happened is my movies were stymied and I, frankly speaking, couldn't really figure out why, because I never felt, rarely felt, let's put it that way, that I was being discriminated against. Um, I did sometimes feel condescended to, I am fortunate in being one of those women who was not, you know, raped, molested, uh, harassed um, in that particular way. Um, but it wasn't until the, uh, statistics came out, Stacy Smith published the statistics um, that showed that women were, you know, I, I was constantly asking myself, well, what am I not doing? What have I not written? Who am I not talking to? I, I've written thrillers, action movies. The only thing I haven't written is comedy, let's put it that way. And I, and my movies still weren't getting made and I kept thinking to myself, well, what am I not doing? And then the statistics came out and I realized, oh, only 7% of movies are written by women and only 4% of them are directed by women. There's, there's nothing that I'm not doing. <laughs> it's not me. It's, it's a, it was a cultural systemic problem. And now that women that, you know, I think with the arrival of this Renaissance of television, the female audience has uh, lent itself to a monetary uh, benefit, right? So suddenly female stories are monetizable in a way that they've never been. And my, my career in my, in, you know, frankly speaking, my mid fifties is busier than it's ever been. Um, and again, I'm sort of experiencing the good fortune of having known what it was like to not have those opportunities and suddenly feeling like a, a, a watershed has has opened and um, and it's fantastic. I mean, it's 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 wonderful and um, but it doesn't mean the business has gotten any easier. Right. It's still always an uphill battle for everyone. 
Thank you. Um, I know we're getting close to running out of time, so I'd like to ask one last question to each of, of um, Gordon and then you, Luke. Um, Gordon, um, as someone who's worked at a firm that has had a, a strong representation of black clients, do you think that the events of the last six or 12 months have created more opportunity for your clients in the same way that perhaps um, some of the things that Hannah's talked about in terms of female and gender equality have, have opened up the doors? It certainly does seem like the studios and networks are now focused on you know, creating more material relevant to, to the civil rights and other themed, black themed projects. So I was just curious to know, in, in, from your perspective, are you seeing any kind of a meaningful sea change? Um, I, I do see a, a change. Is, you know, um, I, I'm still a little skeptical, to be honest. Um, and, and maybe I'm jaded because you know, I, I've lived through a couple of blue cycles in my career um, where it feels like when, you know, a, a, a film like a Black Panther, you know, makes, you know, a bazillion dollars or worldwide and everyone's like, oh, great, wow, I didn't know that that can actually make so much money and let's make more of those things. And as soon as one doesn't uh, perform, then we're back to, oh, well, that doesn't work. So we're not doing that anymore. So, um, you know, I do think that there, that this, it does feel different and I think we could, and my colleagues in, 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 in the industry, you know, over the last six months to a year, feel like this is this is a little different because it's more it's not it's not specific to our industry. You know, it's more cultural and worldwide. Um, so I do feel that it's a, a different moment. I do see a, a shift. However, um, yeah, like Hannah said, you know, it's it's still an uphill battle, and you know there are still barriers to to overcome both in the development phase, um, you know, to get that final green light. Um, and then also, I, I think we will have really made a, a significant change when, you know, films that, you know, that Hannah writes and, and, and films that my, my clients write are allowed to fail and still get another chance. Um, thank you. Luke, um as the final speaker, you know, for, for this afternoon or this evening, um, you've obviously been in this industry for a long amount of time. If you had any final words of advice um, for someone who wants to pursue a career as a writer, um, what would you like to share with them? Well, I, I guess it would be just to say that having delusional self-belief in your forward path um, in the face of all contrary uh, evidence is a is a perfectly okay way to go about your life because it because it may turn out in the end that it wasn't delusional after all. Um, thank you. Um, I really would like to thank um, my three panelists for not only taking out time out of their their busy days, but also for being very honest in sharing information, which I'm sure was um, valuable. Um, I think, you know, anyone who's pursuing a path and career in this industry, um, I think if you're doing it for the right reasons, it can be an incredibly fulfilling opportunity. Um, I think today we're lucky that there are more platforms than there've ever been before for a writer and storytellers to tell their own stories and to find a home. And I think that um, if you get rejected the first time, don't think of it as failure. Failure is only when you kind of don't get it through or happen the first time and you kind of put down the pen and give up, but but keep going because each one of uh, the three panelists today have had their own challenges and their own journeys and they've got where they are today because they're pursuing something that's um, important and passionate to us. Um, I do know that some of you had questions and I'm really sorry that we haven't had time to um, address those um, perhaps there's a way if you want to email those questions, we, we can try and get them um, back to you. But um, on that note, I'd like to also thank the audience. Even though we can't share, we can't see you, um, we know you're out there in great number. And um, my father once told me when you've got something to say, it's nice if somebody is listening. So thank you for uh, thank you for being there. So on that note, I'm going to turn it back over to Isisara to close out the, the, the session.
I can't hear Isisara. That's because she was muted. <laughs> Thank you for saying something. So thanks again, Craig and the panelists and our interpreter and our technical crew. Be sure to watch Derek Middleton's film Shape Up on Eventive and join us next month when there are two short films by other competition winners. And on April 20th, our workshop will spotlight directors. Until then, march on.